What's up guys, Mike here from Ecom Knives, and this is the second episode of the How to Make a Frame Lock. And this isn't a tutorial, so to speak, this is a more of a, you guys are going to follow along and tag along with me while I figure this out. And I've done months and months of homework on this and, and some prototyping, so I'm a bit ahead of the game uh, as it sits right now, but I haven't yet figured out how to make a ready to sell frame lock. So we're going to go through this together and how I'm going to do things, we'll troubleshoot it together. Uh, we could feed, give each other feedback in, in, in the comments section and kind of brainstorm if you will. Now because I'm ahead of the game I've already cut out about a dozen blanks that I'm going to send to heat treat. Right now my goal is to cut out a couple more and send this all out to heat treat and I do all my grinding now after heat treat but I do have this bar of rose damasteel that I, I've been sitting on this uh, rose damasteel for I want to say the better part of a year now waiting for a special project now I don't know that this is gonna work I think it will from from the homework I've done but we're gonna roll the dice on this one so I might lose this 200 and something dollar bar of Damasteel. And if I don't lose it, it's going to be awesome. So to start out, and how I typically start these, because I want the hole that I drill perfectly perpendicular, perfectly 90 degrees, if the bar is not surface ground, that's the first thing I do is I cut it up into blade sized bars and I surface grind it, right? on, uh, on the green giant back there and get it perfectly flat and parallel this way when I do drill the holes they're perfectly straight and theoretically should give me a nice centered blade right and the same thing with the titanium has to be surfaced before you drill anything so that's that's one step but because this came this bar came from the factory uh, like this it looks like they used a fly cutter on a milling machine so it is pretty flat I checked it on the granite surface plate. Uh, this should be good to go. So right now we're just going to glue up our template right here to the steel and we're going to drill some holes. So we're all glued up now and as you can see I didn't have a whole lot of room. Now this design really calls for about a two inch bar of steel. As you can see uh, our flipper tab is going to be a little short. But that's okay. I could shorten it up and, and round it off the best I can. So now what I want to do is, because this bar is a little bit of long, a little bit of long? <laughs> Since this bar is a little long, I'm going to cut it in half right here in between the blades. And to make sure that it stays flat, I don't get a bird edge, I'm just going to hit it on the scotch bright wheel, that, uh, that section there, and kind of give it a little chamfer on the edges so it'll still sit flat when I go to drill it. See, now we got a little bit of a burr here. So we're going to knock that off real quick on the uh, Scotch Bright wheel. Ah, much better. All right, guys, hopefully you can see this. I'm over at the milling machine now and I've put a couple of one, two, three blocks on some parallels in the vise, right? Of course, make sure you smack them down with one of these guys because the back will tend to raise up when you tighten the jaw of the vise, right? The reason we're at the milling machine is because we need that precise uh, perpendicular hole or we might have issues down the road. So we want to get it as precise as possible. So I went in and I marked out the pivot with an optical center punch. Uh, if you don't know what that is, check out my uh, inexpensive tools that are great for the night shop video. And that's one of those tools. It's uh, I think $40. And it's accurate, but we need it even more accurate than this. So we got our pivot lined up. I got a number 13 drill uh, chucked up in a collet in the mill. I would use something like uh, like this guy here 
This is one of those cheapo Chinese keyless chucks, uh, but it wobbles, right? It has horrible run out, so I just use collets when I can. All right, so number 13 drill, and then we're going to ream it up to a, uh, a 316, so 1875 hole. So right now I'm putting in a can twist clamp on the edge here to act as a stop so I don't get the dreaded helicopter, since I'm not going to be clamping the blade down. So we're all lined up, you can pass through right there, and now I'm just going to turn that down a bit. The speed's about 400 RPM, and we're just going to kind of peck our way through. Let it self-align like that, and we'll get the hole started. I'm going to go ahead and peck our way through. Nice and slow. I'm keeping pressure on the blade so it doesn't want to lift up or anything like that. Get that hole nice and uh, nice and square. And we're through. Okay guys, it's time for a little shaky cam, but this part's important. So, I got the holes drilled and reamed to 3 16 so 1875. Right, as centered as I could get it with uh, my optical center punch. So now, I need to get the stop pinhole .3175 away as accurately as I possibly can uh, on two locations, so the top and the bottom. So the way I've come up with to, to get this done, to, to kind of align everything, is I drilled and tapped, uh, not tapped, I, I drilled and reamed a piece of G10 on top of my 123 block setup to 3 sixteenths, the same as the pivot, and then I have this precision ground uh, steel rod that's also 1875 and as you can see the hole is aligned right that so if I hold on for a second let me spin you around let me lock that down so now the quill is locked down so I'll just loosen this I'll tighten this so it's nice and centered and then if I let it go it should come right out like that so now what that allows me to do is take a pivot like that and take the pivot and put it in that hole and now I can move the blade freely but it's still centered with the uh, with the cutter in the mill with the drill or whatever you want to put in there so now I can move it around I can get to it that way this way that way so now all I have to do is move the y-axis of the mill so up and down uh, or back and forth from your angle I move the y-axis of the mill exactly 0 0.3175 and I should line up with these uh, crosshairs so let's go over to my cheapo uh, digital readout so this is the x-axis we don't need that the x is locked so we got the y-axis let me move my little light here there we go I'll kind of hold you steady so we're gonna zero it out right where it is and now I'm gonna move the y-axis to 0.3175. So point 0.2, point, and a digital readout is definitely worth it, guys. There wouldn't be, uh, it would be very difficult for me to do this without it. Uh, and this setup's like 200 bucks, by the way. 0.3175, we're looking for. 1.5, come on. 6, come on. There it is, right there. All right, now I'll lock that down. Of course, when I lock it down, it's going to move a little bit. And I'm probably going to have to adjust it a tiny little bit. Yeah, it moved a little bit. Yeah, that's just for me locking it down. Well, that's, that's what you get with these little mills. There we go. All right, so we're going to leave it right like that. So now that we've moved the table 3175, let's see how where we line up. And we have a convenient little pointer on the bottom of this guy. Let me unlock it. And it looks like we're right there where we need to be. So now if I spin it and I go to the other side, I'm trying to do this all one-handed, guys. Just bear with me. Oh, we fell out. 
obviously I'll clamp that in or hold it down or something so now let's see if we line up with the other side and it looks like we're right there perfect so now all's, all's I have to worry about is aligning it this way uh, the a fore and aft uh, alignment is already taken care of from the table and the mill so this way I'll actually shoot a little under uh, with a 1 8 drill uh, and I'll ream that and I'll shoot a little undersized uh, this way when it comes back from heat treat if the steel moves or grows any uh, a little bit I can just get in there with a, a little Dremel burr attachment or a file or something and clean it up and give myself that little bit of extra room kind of fine-tune the stop where I want it so let me drill that out and I'll show you what I got so we got our holes drilled so I went with um, an eighth of an inch and if you look real close you can see I went just ahead if that'll focus just ahead of my template on both sides I went with an eighth, eighth inch drill and uh, a .1250 reamer now this is a 140 track and that's the end mill I'm going to use is a 140 end mill and that's uh, this guy here uh, Lakeshore Carbide uh, 140 end mill so anyway uh, now I need to reference that middle point again so I have my rotary table and I've already centered it to the spindle on the milling machine uh, now once you have the table centered and this can be kind of a pain you could do it either um, with a coaxial indicator is probably the right way to do it which uh, I do have one of those or if you want a quick way let me see if I have it over here here we go these phase 2 rotary tables are a Moore's 2 taper I believe uh, look it up I forget what taper it is but this is the same exact taper right this is a lathe dead center so essentially what I do is I drop it in to the center hole of the rotary table and then I drop the collet down on top of this obviously not under power or anything until it doesn't wiggle so I pull the quill down and hold it there and move the table until it doesn't wiggle around anymore that's a, a quick and dirty way of getting the rotary table uh, centered so once I did that I made this aluminum fixture plate which is uh, precision ground I bought it that way from McMaster car quarter inch thick so I just need something sacrificial to go on top of it so you see I, I drilled some holes and in order to get this aligned once you have your your table rotary table centered to the quill is I got that same 3 16 precision ground drill rod and a 3 16 hole in the middle of the table and I'll go in and I'll lock it down and align my table tighten the bolts that way uh, another quick way to tell if you're aligned here because these 3 16 rods still have a bit of flex in them is when you let go it should come right out so I could turn the table wonderful hand crank method so I turn the table and I should be able to drop the quill down put it all the way in the hole and let go and it comes right back out all right so that's a quick way to tell uh, how centered you are if it gets hung up you're not centered so I'll give you an example I'll just turn this we'll turn the readout on just so we can go back to zero so I don't lose my spot so there's the y-axis on zero now and we'll we'll put it out call it six thousandths you see what I mean now it's stuck six thousandths of an inch off and it's stuck but I put it back to at two thousands it'll come out and we'll put it back to zero oh, a little past it so right about there we'll call that zero five tenths and it's nice and free it comes out on its own okay so that's a quick way to make sure you're centered up so now I'm going to do the same thing I did to drill those the secondary holes is I'm going to move just one axis right here and I'm going to move it that magic number 0.3175 so we're going to come towards us same thing 0.3175 come on 
three, one, five, six, seven, seven. So that's close enough. Oh, there's the three, one, seven, five. We'll lock it down. It's gonna move. And we're gonna have to adjust it anyway. Oh, there it moved a little bit. Let's go back. Oh, wrong way. I'm just barely touching it to get it to move. Oh, that's the wrong way. There we go. Three, one, seven, five. That's our magic number. So now we should be lined up with that track. You see, I I've milled this before and the sacrificial plate, and we're right in the middle of that track. Let's go to the other side and see where we line up on the other side. Oh, sorry, shaking, turning, turning cranks and dials and stuff, doing it the old way. So let's see, we should end up in the middle of that track again. And get it to a point where you guys can see it. Then we are, we are in the middle of that track. Okay, I know it's hard to see. Uh, so that's essentially it. I'm going to now take that same pivot, drop it in that center hole, clamp it down using this clamp here, and I should be able to mill that track out. Now the reason I drill those holes to beginning in the beginning and and, and uh, is, is so I don't overshoot. So all I have to do is connect the holes. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and we'll see what it looks like once it's done. All right, there we go, fellas. We are clamped in nice and tight. I mean, I'm shaking the whole the whole machine by trying to move that blade. Yeah, that's what you get for a thousand dollar machine. But what are you gonna do? You know, make the best of what you got. So now I should be able to rotate this around. Whoop, wrong dial. Rotate this around, and what I'll do is I'll I'll plunge in on the very edge, so I'm not too hard on the cutter. So I'll aim for the edge of that hole. And then on the dial here, I'll make note of what the number is. And then I'll spin it around the other way and make note of the other number once I get to the other side. And this way, when I'm going down about 40 thousandths uh, depth of cut uh, per pass, uh, and it's 160 thou stock, so I'll make four passes at, I don't know, on this machine, it's probably, uh, probably about 700 RPM, 800 RPM, and a nice slow feed. Even if I turn this really fast, it's pretty slow. Uh, so this way I'll match the numbers on all four passes. This way it's a nice even channel. So, all right, here we go. And I'm just taking some compressed air to help evacuate those chips make the cutter last a little longer, give me a nice cleaner cut. Ideally you would be using coolant or of some kind, but I'll wait till I get that CNC machine to do that. Goggles are a glaring. <laughs> I guess I'll just lose these. I know a lot of you guys uh, yell at me, you gotta wear your goggles. I, I've been, I'm trying. Don't want to lose an eye. Then I definitely can't do this anymore. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. So it looks like we successfully milled out those tracks. Uh, it's hard to see through the paper that's all shredded, but on the back, uh, they look pretty good to me. So now all I have to do is cut these out on the bandsaw and maybe hit them on the surface grinder really quick and. Uh, that's it, they're good to go to heat treat. Well, except for cutting out in the band, so and profiling, and it'll make the spines really nice, and give it like a 220 grit finish. Uh, I heard something about uh, stress risers. If you send it out with a really rough finish, I guess the heat will get into that crack, that really rough finish, and maybe crack the blade. I don't know, they call it a stress riser. They say 120 grit or, or finer to get this. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to just clean these up, profile them, like I said, on the bandsaw, and a little Harbor Freight deal behind me, right there, right over my shoulder. The old way. <laughs> and then, uh, yep, surface grind them on the old dinosaur, and they're off to heat treat. But that's how you mill 
a stop pin tracker, at least that's how I do it. If you guys got a better way, put it down below. Let's uh, let's talk, let's kind of feed off of each other. If you have ideas, please share them, share them with the group, and uh, I'll do the same. So this is Mike here from Ecom Knives. Thanks for sticking with me on episode number two, and I'll catch you on the next video.